Hello interwebs and welcome to a post-Thanksgiving installment of Nuance is a Thing! Because we have to talk about Ernest Cline's latest novel release, Ready Player 2, sequel to his smash success, Ready Player 1. Eh, I see what you did with the titles there, Klein. Because his latest book has been heavily criticized over what's been seen as a transphobic passage about non-binary sex in the book. But is all that actually true? Well, let's briefly break it down while our stomachs break down our food comas, which I hope you did safely this year, by the way. Also, I should say, this video is meant to be an overview of this and related topics, and not the deepest of dives. With this video, I hope to provide you with the tools necessary to talk about this subject knowledgeably, but I'll also link to other videos and articles, both of my own and by others, in the doobly-doo for you to dive deeper into any of this. But with that said, let's plug into the Oasis to discuss Ready Player 2's possible transphobia. So for those of you who don't know, Ready Player One, which was made into a film by the one, the only, Steven Spielberg, is a member berry's trip down memory lane where the protagonist, Wade Watts, lives in a dystopian overpopulated world where everyone is shoved together in overcrowded cities, but who mostly stay isolated in their own small apartments because the world outside is a capitalist and environmental nightmare, so they escape into the virtual reality world known as the Oasis, which is pretty much solely dominated by 1980s popular culture, and in which Wade completes a series of pop culture themed challenges set out by a millionaire whose personal interests have dictated the entirety of the cultural conversation for the past few years, despite him not being all that interesting of a dude. Are we sure that this isn't about 2020? But outside of the plot, the story of the book is mostly just a vehicle to have as many nerdy 80s references as is possible in one story. And both the book and the movie were heavily criticized for their, let's say, regressive views on women. If you want a really good discussion on how Ready Player One frames women, Jenny Nicholson did a great in-depth video on it that I'll link down below, but I need to also delve into the issues myself before we get to the transphobia part of the discussion, because the whole problem with how Klein frames women is germane to the problem with transphobia in Ready Player Two. The first book, Ready Player One, fetishizes and objectifies women as trophies and objects of desire for men, specifically because the story is told through the eyes of an underdeveloped sexuality of an angsty preteen cisgender heterosexual white kid. Again, I say that just because that's what he is. I'm not saying that as a derogatory term against him. He is a preteen cisgender heterosexual white boy. That. That, that's just a fact. Now, to be completely fair, there is an element of truth and intentionality to this portrayal of women within the story. 1980s pop culture, which predominantly focused on tough, beepy, hyper-heterosexual dudes, often framed women in those stories in this way, as damsels in distress or pretty things needing to be saved by men. So men, especially of that era, but still to this day, were told through media and pop culture and society as a whole to be seen as overly tough and only think of women in terms of how they can be used for their sexual needs and desires and not really think of women as people on their own terms or empathize with women's feelings on the subject of their own sexuality. So within the story of Ready Player One, most of the pop culture of the world has all conformed to the desires of a passed away multi-billionaire, who loved 1980s pop culture so much, he created a scavenger hunt to earn his entire fortune that could only be solved by endlessly devoting yourself to 1980s pop culture. It's almost as if people with money have somehow found a way to have a overbearing voice on the direction of culture and society. Hmm. I wonder what that is. But anyways, it would make sense within this world that the protagonist of the book, who tells the story in first person, would have internalized a lot of these messages about women from 1980s pop culture, leading to moments in the book where Wade says things like this. I watched a lot of YouTube videos of cute, geeky girls playing 80s cover tunes on ukuleles. Technically, this wasn't part of my research, but I had a serious cute, geeky girls playing ukuleles fetish that I can neither explain nor defend. Her avatar had a pretty face, but it wasn't unnaturally perfect. Big hazel eyes, rounded cheekbones, a pointy chin, and a perpetual smirk. I found her unbearably attractive. Artemis's frame was short and Rubenesque, all curves. As you can see, and these are some of the more tamer passages, a lot of the views of women are catered towards how Wade sees them, how Wade is viewing them, and only seeing them for their beauty or hypersexualization. That last quote in particular that I referenced was also about the character of Artemis, the main female character of the story. Artemis is portrayed within the book as a smart, independent, and complex character, dealing with things like anxiety and worries about her looks over a childhood scar that she has, which she is able to overcome by being an extremely bold and confident person within the world of the Oasis. So in many ways, as you can see, Ready Player One does actually have a salient understanding of many issues, such as how women and people are able to escape into virtual worlds in order to have a new form of identity to play with identity. 
And the fact that the story is told through Wade's eyes does allow there to be this sort of veneer of, well, of course this is how the book frames women because that's the viewpoint we're given. We're being told the story through Wade, so of course we're going to see women from that point of view in that sort of hypersexualized 1980s pop culture sort of way. The issue with this, however, is that the viewpoint of Wade's in the first book is never critically analyzed by Klein. In fact, it's often deeply enabled within the story. Artemis, despite showing strong independence throughout the book, quickly falls deeply in love with Wade because, well, because he's the protagonist of the story and the protagonist gets the girl. Wade never really feels like a good romantic match for Artemis or the fact that he even really thinks too much about her feelings. But the plot bends and conforms to him to get his trophy girl at the end of the story, despite Artemis being in many ways a more complex of a character than Wade. We also see something similar happen with the character of H in the story, which I think I'm mispronouncing, but I'm going to go with H for this discussion. But H, Wade's best friend within the story, has an avatar in the virtual reality world of the Oasis who is described as, quote, a tall, broad-shouldered Caucasian male with dark hair and brown eyes. I asked him once if he looked anything like his avatar in real life, and he jokingly replied, yes, but in real life, I'm even more handsome. Turns out, though, that H in real life is actually a black lesbian woman. Again, there's something really interesting to be talked and discussed about here within the story. About how to exist in online spaces, many minority groups often need to hide their identity as a minority in order to get the same level of respect as straight white cisgender dudes. But the book only really brings up the discussion in how it relates to Wade, who is described at length in the book as being angry at first at being lied to by his best friend, but gets over it and accepts H as his best friend still, though still only mainly refers to him by male pronouns throughout the rest of the story. All of the intrigue around H's character is left as just simply fact, just simply there, but never really analyzed except in how it relates to Wade. This isn't necessarily a fault of the book. It's something that I would love to be more critically analyzed and discussed because it's a deeply interesting topic, but Klein's under no real need or push to have to discuss these things, but he is the one that brought it up. So between Artemis and H in the book, we see that Klein is only ever really interested in women within the story and how they relate to his male protagonist, even when those women are complex characters. And even worse though, when it comes to Artemis, he shows that he is still willing to reduce complex female characters in order to allow them to be the prize for male characters. So to reiterate there, it's not great, but okay if he wanted to at least mention these topics, but not really delve into them. He doesn't have to. But the very fact that he makes Artemis bend to the male character's desires, even though that doesn't make sense for her character, is actually a major problem with his writing. It's still falling into those 1980s sexist tropes. And it should be said, we do see these views reflected by Ernst Klein himself in his own work. I want to be careful here, though, because I'm not here to necessarily condemn the man. In fact, you'll see my thoughts on him later on in this video. Nor am I going to try and psychoanalyze him. But it is worth noting that he wrote a whole poem about how he wished there were more geeky girls for him to see in porn. I'll link to that down in the down below. Again, there is a level of like, okay, he gets that there's some level of women being portrayed incorrectly within media, but he's only discussing this issue through the most self-interested way possible, through porn for men. He acknowledges that women can be varied within this poem, but still only reflects on them by how they can be viewed and, and commercialized for men's sexuality. So while Ernst Klein does, in Ready Player One, offer up some intriguing ideas about how capitalism in society frames straight, white, hypersexualized men as the default, and how that hurts women, people of color, and even men who don't fit into that perfect hypersexualized norm, he's really only ever interested in how it fits into the man's viewpoint. And as I said, that wouldn't be so bad if he either critically analyzed that, which he doesn't, or at the very least, didn't fall into the same tropes of making women into trophies and lose agency within the narrative in order to conform to a male protagonist's desires, which Klein does. This finally brings us to Ready Player Two, which is rife with many of the same exact problems as Ready Player One, which is incredibly disappointing given that Ernst Klein has had a ton of chances to learn and address these types of criticisms within his next book. But the section of the book that has received the most direct criticism today has to deal with transgender and non-binary folks. In the book, Wade breaks into the personal records of fellow gamer Longgren, who is known as Skylar in the real world, and we get this passage. My chest felt hollow. I closed all of the VivFeed windows and scanned Skylar's user profile for more information about her. Her school records included a scan of her birth certificate, which revealed another surprise. She'd been DMAB, designated male at birth. Discovering this minor detail didn't send me spiraling into a sexual identity crisis the way it probably would have back when I was younger. Thanks to years of surfing the ONI net, I now knew what it felt like to be 
be all kinds of different people, having all different kinds of sex. I experienced sex with women while being another woman, and sex with men as both a woman and a man. I'd done playback of several different flavors of straight and gay and non-binary sex just out of pure curiosity. And I'd come away with the same realization that most ONI users come away with. Passion was passion and love was love regardless of who the participants involved were or what sort of body they were assigned at birth. First of all, there is a lot to discuss with Wade casually invading Sather's privacy, even going so far as to joke about going big brother on her. This is a terrible thing to do to, uh, anybody? But especially a non-out transgender person who may be subject to violence if their transgender identity is revealed without their permission to those who may not accept them. But even moving beyond the invasion of privacy discussion, Wade discusses that Skylar is a trans woman, which he calls surprising. He then goes on to awkwardly word a passage where Wade, and we can assume by proxy Klein, is trying to be affirming of transgender and non-binary people, but does so in a way that fantasizes and fetishizes transgender and non-binary bodies. He says things like straight, gay, and non-binary sex are all different, as if different human beings have some sort of weird, different type of sex. We even get the acknowledgement by Wade himself in that passage that he has tried on different identities within the virtual world and even felt comfortable with many of them, even if some forms of them are not his bag. In all honesty with you, this passage is really confusing and hard to break down because it's messy. I want to acknowledge first here though that Wade and Klein are both trying to be affirming with this passage, and honestly that's actually a really good thing. For all of its mistakes, if I could wave a wand and make everybody in the world get to this point of acceptance of transgender and non-binary folks, I would do it in a heartbeat and be happy for it. I appreciate that he is trying to understand and be affirming with this passage, so I at least want to acknowledge that Klein is trying to be accepting of trans folks here. This, by the way, stands in stark contrast to passages like this one in Ready Player One, where Klein showed an even worse degree of understanding and acceptance of transgender and non-binary folks, where he insinuated that trans women aren't actually women, especially if they haven't gotten gender confirmation surgery yet. Again, I don't think that was his intention with that passage in the first book, but it's definitely something that's not at all critically analyzed or thought about and showcases a complete lack of understanding of trans people as well as transphobia on Klein's part. And I wish to remind everyone that having transphobia and expressing transphobia are not the same thing as being an active transphobe who tries to actively harm and hurt the transgender community. You can express transphobic things even if you don't intend to. And even trans people do this themselves sometimes. I've done this sometimes. Though perhaps not often to the same level that Klein does in this passage in the initial Ready Player One. Going back to Ready Player Two though, the passage that I earlier highlighted shows growth on Klein's part. It shows that he is actually trying to learn more about the transgender community and be more accepting. But here is where I'm going to be critical. First off, he does get a lot of things wrong here, as I've kind of already outlined. And it shows that Klein did not reach out to any transgender or non-binary folks when writing that passage. Given that he is one of the best-selling authors in the entire world, he would have had access to those resources. I'm sure many people, myself included, would have happily offered up our assistance in helping him write these passages with a much more critical and analyzed eye towards trans people. It also highlights his incredible ignorance, and it still centers transgender experiences as something sort of intriguing or fantastical that Wade, an ergo a cisgender straight white male, could escape into quite literally like a cool video game. It subtly reinforced that trans people are different and strange. I mean, there's so much discussion that could be had about just the fact that Wade got to experience other gender identities through a virtual realm, and seems to be casually nonchalant about it. I mean, when that happens, I feel like discussions of gender in society would become a lot more fluid. Now, to be fair, credit where credit is due, this passage does appear in the book. Coming out as O-gender became incredibly common in the wake of the ONI's release. For the first time in human history, anyone 18 years of age or older could safely and easily experience sexual intercourse with any gender and as any gender. This tended to alter their perception of gender identity and fluidity in profound ways. It had certainly altered mine, and I was certain it had done the same thing for every other ONI user with even a mildly adventurous spirit. Thanks to the Oasis neural interface, your gender and your sexuality were no longer constrained by, or confined to, the physical body you happened to be born with. And that passage showcased is that there is some element of that in the world of Ready Player Two. But Ernst Klein only seems interested in how trans and non-binary folks, just like women in both books, are framed in relation to their interest to straight cisgender white men. But why is all of this important? I mean, why do we even care? I mean, why don't we just let Klein write whatever he wants? It's totally fine. I mean, it's his book to write. He can write whatever he wants to write about. And I totally accept and acknowledge that. But here's the thing. He is the one that brought it up. 
He is the one that is taking transgender narratives and putting it in his book. And considering that this is going to be probably one of the best-selling books of the year, the fact that it is misrepresenting and highlighting harmful tropes to the transgender community and the non-binary community is deeply harmful to trans people as a whole. It reinforces stereotypes that lead to the fantasticization and dehumanization of trans people. Again, one book does not create all of these problems. I'm not saying that this one book is responsible for every single harm that trans people face, but it's just another thing on the pile of problematic portrayals of trans people. And when you build up so many problematic portrayals of trans people, it starts to create them in people's minds views of what trans people are, and then does start to inform how people interact with trans people. This can be sort of minute ways, just people misunderstanding trans people, but we have seen how it becomes incredibly harmful within the very culture that Ernst Klein is talking about, pop culture and 1980s video games. You see, all this is made even worse in a post-Gamergate world. To oversimplify, and I'll link to more things down in the down below for you to learn more about Gamergate, but again, to oversimplify, Gamergate was a movement by predominantly straight white cisgender men, though not exclusively them, that framed itself as about video game journalism and the problems with video game journalism. But really, the whole Gamergate movement devolved more into this same kind of problem, with men in the gaming and nerd communities who had spent their entire lives being told by the media that they loved that women were objects for them to consume, and that they only needed to care about women and transgender and non-binary folks and how they related to their own needs, became so caught up in believing that, that they started to see real-life women in geek spaces as having to conform to their needs and desires rather than existing on their own terms. And they reacted to the fact that women didn't want to be seen as just objects of their desires with harassment and abuse targeted at those women. These toxic folks also harassed and abused and pushed out transgender women and non-binary folks, as well as trans men, but I also want to focus a little bit on transgender women, though I don't want to erase trans men, but they did harass transgender women in geek spaces because as popular geek culture like Klein's reinforced the idea that transgender people are fantastical or different or weird, as well as men just pretending to be women, that thereby transgender women were not useful to straight white men's sexuality. Or, even worse, if a straight white man who wasn't a geek space but ascribed to geek gamer gate culture was interested romantically or sexually in transgender women, which is, you know, quite possible considering that transgender women are women and straight men can find them just as attractive as cisgender women. I mean, believe me, I met many men who find me attractive, as many of you in the comments may disagree with, but it is true, there are people who find me attractive, you know. It is a thing. But when these men start finding trans women attractive and they still have this internalized transphobia and don't want to be seen as being gay for being with a man, quote unquote, they'll often react by physically harming or mentally harassing that trans person. And I've done videos on this type of mindset as well as where it comes from in pop culture, so check out those videos down in the down below if you want further discussions on this issue by this way. But generally, that's a much larger discussion than this video can get into, and one that I don't think that Ernst Klein necessarily prescribes to you in an abusive way. But his writing and characters are only a few stops away from some of the worst thoughts of Gamergators. Again, I wish to say, I don't think that Klein believes in Gamergate or, or uh, thinks that that abuse is tolerated. I, I definitely think that he disagrees with all that stuff. But it is something that his writing does enable. So, to conclude, I want to reiterate, Klein's writing is trying to be affirming. He does show some element that he does at least want to understand and accept some of the intricacies of gender, sexuality, race, identity, and how they are expressed in virtual spaces dominated by popular culture and a society that says straight, white, cisgender, hypermasculine men are the default. And the further that someone deviates from that norm, visually or identity-wise, is seen as weird, fantastical, or different. However, Klein shows no real interest in dissecting those ideas outside of how they affect his straight, white, cisgender, slightly less than the hypermasculine type of protagonist that we usually see, who is clearly a type of author insert for Klein himself. And to reiterate, this would be to some degree acceptable, or at least something that I could get past, because Klein is under no obligation to explore those elements of his world as a writer. But he is the one that brings them up. And if he brings them up, he better bring them up accurately, especially considering the amount of platform that his book has. So the fact that he leans on and reinforces stereotypical harmful tropes that fantasize, objectify, and dehumanize these identities, especially the identities of trans and non-binary folks, some of the most marginalized people in our society in Ready Player Two, is a deep, deep disappointment. And this is made even worse by the fact that the book itself is all about and seems to understand the power that pop culture has to influence the entirety of society. So it's disappointing that Klein would use his huge platforms as one of the best-selling authors of today to reinforce tropes that can lead directly to entrenching views that lead to the harm and objectification of these identities within the real world.
All right, I hope that this was a, you know, sort of brief overview of some of the problems within Ernst Klein's writing in both Ready Player One and Ready Player Two. I will say, despite all of this stuff, there is an element of me that does kind of like Ready Player One, both the movie and the book, and I am actually reading Ready Player Two right now, and I have gotten to the passages that we are discussing here. So I don't want to be overly, overly condemning of it. There is an element of, I like this being escapist fantasy, but that's kind of the point. The book itself is about critiquing escapist fantasy without really being critical of its own self. So it's honestly just kind of funny how close Klein gets to understanding the problems while completely, completely missing them. And so I wanted to discuss them here, but I'm not condemning you if you like Ready Player Two. I'm reading the book and despite these problems that I have with it, I still kind of enjoy it as a weird, dumb, sort of escapist fantasy. But what do you think? Am I weird for still liking the book or still enjoying it to a modicum of a degree even though I have this many problems with it? Let me know down in the comments below. Also, if you want to uh, subscribe to the channel for more discussions on, you know, transphobia and gender issues within popular culture and nerd culture and discussions of Star Trek as well, that's all here on this channel. Also, I have a Patreon that you can help support me at if you want to help make this channel even better and help contribute to my dream of doing this full time one day. But regardless of all of that, I hope that you, as always, live long and prosper. Thank you so much to all of my patrons, especially Catherine Lambeth, Ashley Allen Bokikio, Miranda Janelle, Eli Berg Moss, Ashlyn Solstice, Greg Gillum, Stephen Kleinard, Randy Thompson, Chamomile T, Philip Sorbello, Munir Amlani, Boyd and Mary Beth Earl, Stephen Schuthart, Wellington Marcus, Wayne Twitchell, Buttoneer, Ish the Mad, Dominic Noble, John Steele, Gavin Robinson, Michael Beam, William Stewart, Nathan Olson, Amanda Ronnie Indange, The Sir Spence, BBD, Hannah F., Miguel Posadas, Jason Knott, Maeve, Andrew Jorgenston, Sabraxis, Jasmine, Chris Brown, Bree Beecher, Nathan Steele, Chloe Dollar, Jane Packard, Dante St. James, Wendizel Bizzle, Geek Filter, Mark the Edge, Pissed and Twisted Garage, Gretchen Badger, Sarah Bystam, Celestial Dawn, Polly Mina, Din, Jean Mithoon, Lysa, Andrew Lamoureux, Zone One Librarian, Michael Hardy. Thank you, all of you, especially this month.